This is Paul Burnett interviewing uh, Bill Langer for the Global Mining and Materials Research Project of the Business Series of the Oral si History Center of the Bangkok Library. And it's Wednesday, February 18th, 2015. As far as the government side that interfaces in direct and indirect ways with the mining industry, the mid-90s are a pretty bad time. Uh, it's, I guess 94 is the contract with America uh, from Congress, and, and there's this kind of fiscal responsibility orientation uh, in, this, in spite of the fact that it's boom years in, in tech and other sectors. Um, there's this uh, cutback um, climate, I suppose. The US Bureau of Mines is shut down in 95-96, in and there's this this trimming here, and there's this adaptation that your group does. Uh, the, the the person in charge, whose name was? Do you remember his name? The uh, person who made that deal, saying if we make a project oh, that is profitable, I believe the director profitable. at the time was Gordy Eaton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the director of the USGS, the USGS. Over, and he was able to make that yes. pitch, and they bought it yeah. and bought in again. Yeah. Now, actually, I think the timing of that was either very late '90s or or early uh, 2000s, in the midst or just coming out of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, contract with America and so forth. Yeah, yeah. But before that, something else happened. Um, this the survey was trying to reinvent itself, and they had people come in and train us on, you know huggy, squeezy, you know, warm, fuzzy kinds of stuff. You know, I mean, <laughs> uh, kumbaya, kumbaya kind of stuff, you know, how to manage people and oh, okay. better, better. And yeah. one of the goals was, uh, or one of the things they tried to do was um, have people empower the people to, to uh, uh, have more control over the organization itself. Mm -hmm. Well, a group of us said, they want to play that game, we'll do it. <laughs> and we started, Something, uh, I can't even remember the acronym that we had, but basically it was a group of us that got together and said, we believe that, that multidisciplinary geology is the way that the USGS should go. And so we put together, we, we followed all these steps that the people told us you should do. And we actually went to the chief hydrologist and chief geologist. We never got to the director, mm. but we had a meeting with those people making a, well, I know we call ourselves the E-team, the environmental team. And we went to the director saying that these are the, or the, the chiefs of the division saying, this is the kind of stuff that we think we should be doing collaboratively as, a, as, a, as an interdivisional, intradivisional, interdivisional group. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they kind of bought it, uh, right. and that eventually gave us some of the leg up to why the the Front Range project came about. Because many of the people that were part of the E team uh, became part of the Front Range project. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. So you, you there, so there was some, uh, even though it was huggy and squeezy, uh, interpreted in the correct way, it, it produced, uh, it produced yes. some results, yep. and, and uh, you were able to run with it. Right. Um, and so uh, that's a, uh, just for, from the records here, it says uh, um, 1996 to 2001 okay. yeah. was the Colorado Front Range okay. Infrastructure Resources Project. So it winds down early 2000s, as you say. And, uh, and in 2002, you become the senior research geologist for uh, the geology of industrial minerals. Yes. So can you talk about how, is that a new position or are you taking over something that has been going on for a while? There are more titles than positions. Um, what happened was that the, the Front Range study of aggregates went over so well, they said, let's, let's broaden this to look at all the industrial minerals along the Front Range. Mm -hmm. and, and as a matter of fact, the Forest Service was one of the people that really wanted us to do that because there is the idea that Forest Service land is a multi-use land and that there are resources on it. And if done carefully, they can be developed. And so they wanted to know what was on some of those lands. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was appointed the, or and agreed to be, and pushed for, mm -hmm. uh, to, to be the, the project chief and 
along with that then came this glorious title. <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically I was a senior research geologist and they then add to it by adding that, that, little, that little modifier to it for industrial minerals. But it sounds like, uh, it, it sounds like it's more in keeping with your identity as a, as a researcher, that you wanted this stuff to be useful. Absolutely. The work that you did to, to, to reach people, to reach projects, to, to produce new knowledge and new work. Yes. Um, but something else came about at the same time. In, in the, in the mid-90s, I was introduced to SME. I'm, I'm a relatively new member in SME. I've, I've only been here 20-some years. And people my age, most people my age, have, were, were here 30 or 40. Yeah. And so and they got in on the ground floor, and I did not. Yeah. Uh, and SME became my compass. Yeah. It really helped me identify, where, and the people in it, helped me identify where are their needs and, and where are they that relate to, to mining. Yeah. My only exposure to mining, the first job I had was, mining, was mapping where existing aggregate operations were, so I was looking for mines. Yeah. But as a geologist, the only reason that I looked in a sand or gravel pit was to see the, the exposures yeah, afforded the by a hole in the ground right. rather than peering down something I dug. I mean, yeah. you know, Mother Nature didn't provide such nice observation points. I didn't even look at the equipment off of the side. Yeah. I'd go in and I'd, I'd stop at a young wiper snapper, still shave head, and, and would uh, uh, go up to the scale house and say, hey, can I look in there and there, uh, look in your pit? And they say, I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey. Can I make it a map? And they said, sure. Uh, if it's big and yellow, stay out of its way. Because <laughs> it was uranium? That was, that was the truth. No, no, no. <laughs> or the trucks. Oh, the trucks. <laughs> Earth moving equipment. Okay. That was my safety training. Right. No hard hats, no steel toed boots, no nothing. Yeah. Not even a, you know, nothing. Right. And they just let me along. Alone in there. By the time I got to the front range, I had to sign papers. I had to have on-site job training, I, mm -hmm. and, and I don't mind it. I, yeah. did, I never minded because they would still let me in and look, right. uh, and I was perfectly willing. But you know, a complete change. But it also a change for me to where, uh, in the in un, until the '90s, what's that equipment? It was you know, in the, at least it was on the floor of right. the pit, so it wasn't in my way. Right, right, right. Uh, and the only problem was that where they were mining the face, I had to stay because it was big and yellow, and I had to stay out of the way. Right. <laughs> but but uh, then starting in the in the mid '90s, I started spending all this time looking at the equipment mm -hmm. and seeing what do they have to do mm -hmm. to make this sand and gravel something they can sell. Mm -hmm. I thought they just uh, pulled up a truck and dug it and threw it in the bag and it went up. That's yeah. not the case. Right. I mean, it's a, a real serious job. Yeah. Yeah. And, and at that time, I met a, a fellow named Mike Sheehan, and he, uh, he was in the aggregate business, and, and he was part of the Front Range Project, too, or, or at least a resource for them. He taught me everything I know about the aggregate business, not about geology, mm -hmm. but the business. And the first thing he told me was there are three parts to the aggregate business. There's product, there's marketing, and there's everything else. If you don't have a product, and you're out of business. If you can't market it, you're out of business. And he said, Bill, geology is in everything else. Yeah. And when anything, when things have to go, it's the everything else. But you cannot do away with marketing, and you cannot do away with the product preparation. Yeah. And it was an eye opener for me because I was a geologist. I thought geology was everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and here I end up, geology is everything else and it's expendable. Yeah. And along the same lines, uh, uh, one of my other friends, a uh, uh, short-lived, short-time friend because we, we weren't together that long, he's, uh, he told me when I was visiting his pit, the only reason they hire a geologist is so they have somebody to fire during a downturn. Six months later, there was a downturn, and he was gone. Wow. So how prophetic. Oh, dear. So it just really helped me see what. So I'm thinking, what can I do as a geologist? I'm not going to be fired tomorrow. Right. What can I do as a geologist that can help the aggregate industry, that can help the mining of aggregate? And that's where SME came in and provided me with a compass. 
And then at the, that expansion of my efforts to include industrial minerals provided me with an even better compass mm -hmm. to, house, to see how geology can really be used yeah. to address serious bona fide issues other than just, oh, that's a geologic curiosity. Gee, that's kind of neat to know. Right. It's, it's, it's more than that. There are real ways that geology enters the game. And I'm grateful to Samita for, for bringing me along. Well, the timing is such, it, it works out with the other information that I've been gathering. The, the U.S. Bureau of Mines is shut down in 95. And um, the story is that some of the information services that the U.S. Bureau of Mines used to do got uh, shipped out to the U.S. Geological Survey. So I don't know how that fits into your story, uh, whether there's an official transfer of resources. Uh, according to my sources, that there, there was not really a transfer of personnel so much. Uh, uh, but the, 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 the information gathering um, aspect uh, in terms of geolo geological um, knowledge got transferred to, to the USGS. You know, what happened, uh, the Bureau of Mines used to do all kinds of research and yeah. come up with some very, very good uh, ways of pro processing minerals. Uh, froth flocation is a perfect example mm -hmm. of, a, of a technique now that's employed all over the world, designed because of Bureau of Mine efforts. Mm -hmm. um, priceless for the yeah. mining industry. But yeah, for some reason, people didn't think the Bureau of Mines was necessary, but there was one part of it, and that was the part that collects statistics, and they've been on production, and they've been doing so since the late 1800s. Right. I go back to them all the time. I, I, history is a lot to me, and I, I still use those old documents. Hmm. But they did transfer that function and the few people, very okay. few people that were doing that, and there were a few other tag-alongs that were part of that group that weren't actually doing statistics, they were doing the analysis mm -hmm. of the statistics. But most of it was just collecting the statistics. Mm -hmm. Most of those people ended up in Reston, Virginia, but the ones that were doing the analysis ended up in Denver. Mm -hmm. And I befriended many of them mm -hmm. because they were doing exactly the kind of thing that I thought was valuable. What can you learn from the history of production mm -hmm. to see, to, to use to predict what might happen in the future? Right. What, what happens? To bumps when you find a, a downturn. Right. Uh, how does how do the how does the production recover over time? Right. And so there were. Uh, I was I was only lucky enough to get uh, to work on one paper together with a person from that group mm. because they had very tight controls over their time. Yeah. But we put together a, a, a paper describing. Uh, what has happened along the front line, uh, front range, mm -hmm. and they were included in that front range study, mm -hmm. and uh, and it, uh, historically he put together a chart showing the the construction of um, uh, oh that's Cheyenne Mountain. Right. You know, I mean that, there was a big blip there and a big blip in the Denver Airport when that was built, and you can see the use of construction materials how all of these things. Uh, affect the demand for aggregate, right. and then we we looked at how you might uh, um, how urban growth and transport distances affected the ability to meet the demand and needs for aggregate uh, mm -hmm. collectively. Yeah, and road and highway construction, I imagine, which is a bit more of a constant, I guess. Uh, it came in spurts. Yeah, but uh, but it was always there. It was always a background, it was a, 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 an upward line, but a wiggly upward line right. as opposed to the. Some that just go and stop and never get them. Cheyenne Mountain was once. The airport was once. Right. Well, it sounds like you're 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 almost venturing into mineral economics territory. You're yes. thinking about um, you know the trajectories of, of production and the boom and bust cycles and those kinds of things. That's something that you're interested in and tracking. Um, but it also sounds like um, there are services that the U.S. Bureau of Mines used to provide that. Even even with the transfer, no longer available, and so there's. A, I imagine that this was the kind of work you were doing was welcome. So you learned a lot from SME, but SME was probably grateful that you were there doing that, uh, doing that kind of research. I I like to think so, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I hate to brag, but I am the recipient of the Hal Williams Heritage Award, which is for 
outstanding contribution to the industrial minerals industry. Mm -hmm. And that validates my career to mm -hmm. me because that's what I wanted to do to impact the industry. I didn't want, I want to just have maps sitting on a shelf. Right. And when I found out I was a recipient of that award, it just made my day. And I still, I can't believe the emotional meaning to me. Huh. It, it's, uh, it, uh, it's just wonderful. And it's, it's uh, uh, you know, um, industrial minerals is not something we, we typically know a lot about when, when there's um, education about mines, um, the kind of sexy mine stuff is gold and uh, the hard, you know, the, the metals and the hard rock mining and coal mining is, if it's not sexy, it's notorious, yes, right? And right. it's got this, it's the, it's the bad boy of the industry <laughs> right, right. in the public, you know, in the public mind, perhaps. Uh, and so industrial minerals is, uh, as you said, because you didn't know what went into it before you started. You kind of thought it was relatively unproblematic. Uh, right. You, it's rock. Right. It's yeah, and I was a geologist. Right. I should have known better. <laughs> I should have known better. <laughs> So can you talk about the, the learning curve for you in terms of industrial minerals and, and w w it's not just one or two, it's not just aggregate, it's not just the stuff that goes in cement, it's many things. Uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about what industrial minerals are, are useful for and, and uh, what's tricky about mining industrial minerals from, from your perspective as a geologist? Okay, I, th I think... Um the, as far as my learning curve goes, I throw myself into things. And it, in the Front Range, um, the, the Bureau of Mines, or the folks that were left over from the Bureau of Mines, track the production. And they track the location of existing operations. And so it was very easy <clears throat> to see where this is being done. And so the next question that comes about is, well, we know physically where it's being done, what kind of rock is it being done in, uh, and what are the problems that go along with it. And that's where, that's where it starts to get tricky. And basically, what I wanted to do was first learn as much as I could about that industrial mineral. Mm -hmm. And so uh, collectively, uh, with a, a, a couple other scientists, primarily Anna Wilson, we went and put together some papers looking at the history of industrial minerals. I've, I've done the same thing with aggregate. To, for, for me to understand a commodity, I have to see how it's changed over time. Right. And I looked at the very first time when, when people were using aggregate. I mean, I, Stone Age, everybody likes to go back to that. Right, I mean, right. Realistically, yeah. it, before we had good roads, and starting with the good roads movement, and then the interstate highways, and all the way through to, to see what happened. Well, I did the same thing with industrial minerals in the, in the front range. Mm -hmm. Which state, I mean, which uh, counties, or wh where had they been been produced in the Front Range? Right. And we quickly learned well there 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 weren't there wasn't enough data just in the Front Range to understand this. So I went through the we went through the whole 17 Western states and looked at the industrial minerals, mm -hmm. and then you start seeing where things are being done. That, that New Mexico does uh, perlite, and and uh, Washington does diatomaceous earth. And then you say, well, what's driving these markets? I mean, somebody didn't just wake up some morning and say, I'd, I'd like some perlite. Mm -hmm. what, what's driving the market? Well, and, and how, it, strangely enough, perlite as an example, wasn't even on anybody's radar until the, the 1940s. Mm -hmm. it's a, perlite is something that you buy in a bag, it's white, it looks like puffed wheat or yeah. puffed rice, yeah. but it's a rock. Mm -hmm. And in, in the mid-40s, there's two stories of how it was developed, and I'll go with the one I like. Okay. <laughs> and, and that was that a, a geologist was sitting on a beach in, in an island in Greece, a volcanic island in Greece, Milos, and had a campfire there. And the got, fire got real hot and started popping the rocks. And said, hey, maybe we can use this. And they decided they would start, you know, what could we use it for? And it became a, a lightweight aggregate with all kinds of uses. Mm -hmm. Well, it quickly caught on, and, and many Western states have sources of, of perlite. Uh, over, uh, but over time, and so does Greece, where they found it. Well, Greece tried to, uh, the problem is it's heavy mm -hmm. until you pop it. Okay. 
And then it's bulky. Yeah. And so how do you get it from western states where we want it, or where it exists, to the eastern states where we want it? Well, you move it in a railroad car when it's heavy. Because, yeah. I mean, you can't afford to ship empty. You know, a 100-ton railroad car with five tons of perlite popped in. Yeah. So the popping plants are all where it's needed. Yeah. And for a while, rail worked. And they tried bringing it from Greece, but they just couldn't maintain a, a supply. Well, they came up with the idea of just-in-time supply. Hmm. And so now, they'll bring it from Greece, drop it off at a, at a U.S. popping plant, and pop it so it's not going from the West. So now, we're importing large amounts of perlite from Greece. Hmm. Well, some things have happened to that market recently. And the U.S. market is picking up. In fact, we're now exporting to Canada. And Greece is not taking it to Canada, not bringing it here. So we're, it, it's, it's cutting to the market. Well, that, those kinds of things, and I use perlite as an example, those are the kinds of things that make the market of industri make industrial minerals interesting and something that as a geologist, if you understand those things, then you can worry less about physically where it exists, and more like the properties. What does it need to do to, to pop? Right. I mean, another example would be lightweight aggregate made from heating clay. Mm -hmm. Well, clay does one of two things when you heat it. It either turns into a brick yeah. or it blows up into lightweight aggregate. Mm -hmm. There are no mineralogical associations between which it does. It's like, how do you know? Really? Experience. Really? Really. And so... You know, some of these things as a geologist, it makes your life complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to understand those things uh, in, in figuring out how geology can be brought to bear. But the bottom line that you need to understand and convey to the people is that Mother Nature puts it where Mother Nature wanted it. Right. And, it and not in my backyard. If it's in your backyard, that may be the only place it is. Mm -hmm. And we have to learn how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest things that I find about industrial minerals mm -hmm. uh, as far as the mining. Sure, there's, there's issues that relate to the, the geologic structure, nicely layered, simple geology is easier to mine than contorted geology yeah. and that sort of thing. But miners know that. Ge well, some of them do. Yeah. Uh, but most geologists do. But I try to reach these other niches where people kind of forget about them mm -hmm. and bring them to the forefront and, and educate people. And, and the other people, part is to just let people know yeah. that when they brush their teeth in the morning, they're putting rocks in their mouth. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, uh, it sounds, again, it sounds to me that you've got a bit of an economist in your blood there. <laughs> you're, I, you're thinking about access to markets, you're thinking about distance, you're thinking about mode of travel, and, and, uh, and in addition to the geology, so the geology becomes the piece of a larger uh, social, political, and economic puzzle. And that, Absolutely. And that's the, you like the puzzle solving, but you like your puzzles complex. Yes. I think you hit on it. Yeah. yeah really yeah. kind of not looked at it that way. Yeah. But you're it's, right. It's, it, it's, it, it needs to be complex for you to be, for you to find it satisfying. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you like bringing to bear. And so, you know, one of the goals in this project is, to, you know, thinking downstream to education and, and people with accomplished careers. Uh, one theme is that uh, you get more mileage. Uh, in terms of job satisfaction, career satisfaction, and advancement by learning different things and keeping moving. It sounds to me like you've, you've had a kernel of you want interdisciplinarity, you want contact with different kinds of disciplines and knowledge, different kinds of people, different kinds of projects, and, and you like to keep moving. Uh, even there's fate as part of it, as you've said, but you're also active in, in making choices about about uh, becoming part of communities and part of knowledge communities and that's something that you're uh, that you've you've done really well at um, and so these these industrial minerals are complicated and I've talked with others about the ways in which they're complicated uh, they they're sometimes have unique properties in particular locations which is why geology is so important and sometimes they also combine them into compounds that have particular applications uh, that satisfy particular markets. 
Um, so you finish up that part of your career around 2011. Can you talk a little bit about what, what, it's, what happens after that? <laughs> yes, I'd love to. Um, when when uh, our grandchildren were born, we spent large amounts, which was, uh, we have a 10, 11 year old, so 2004 and five, I believe, if I do the math right. <laughs> Um, we uh, would take regular trips back and forth to, we lived in Denver and, and regular trips between Denver and Phoenix Division. And when our granddaughter was born, she ha happened to be born on my birthday, mm -hmm. uh, they moved in to a new house. And about two years later, they called and said, Mom, Dad, the house across the street has a lockbox on it, and we want you to buy it. And you know, we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, we loved our parents, but I'm not sure we'd want to live in a house across the street for them. And so, when we thought about it, said, so, well, maybe we could. So we went down, put an offer on the house. It was turned down, and so we thought we'd let them stew a bit. And our son-in-law called up a couple of weeks later and said, don't let that house get away. Our son-in-law. Mm -hmm. Now, we only have one child, and so it was not favoritism moving there. And so we went down, bought the house, and rented it. So we rented it out, and we knew for five years that we would be moving down there, mm -hmm. getting closer and closer to when I was ready to retire. Uh -huh. And the day came when, when I, there was no reason not to retire, and we put our house on the market and moved down there. That's what got us out of Denver. And at that time, we decided that... I would dearly love to continue in the business, mm -hmm. but clearly not full time. And we decided, well, maybe quarter time would be enough to spend whatever quarter time is. I, I don't have a punch clock. Right, say, right. How do, how do I keep track? So right. whatever, basically what we meant was, if it starts to be where I'm getting too much work, we'll stop. Yeah. And I was fortunate to pick up a, a consulting job as an expert witness right away, mm. right away. And that uh, continued, and I've continued on doing consulting at that level, mm -hmm. being a full-time grandfather, father, and husband, and being and a part-time <laughs> neighbor, <laughs> <laughs> and being a part-time geologist. And yeah. I'm just, just loving it, and still get to associate with people like this, come back once a year and see my old friends and get together and, and share stories about what's going on. That's wonderful. And the best part is people pay me for their, my work now, mm -hmm. which means they want it. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't useful, yeah. they wouldn't pay me. And so now my, my whole goal through my life has been to do useful work. Yeah. And now they're validated every time I get a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Which, yeah, which is a double. Then. Yeah. I mean, it's, the money is nice, but it's also... We like what you do. Yeah. And I have a, a, a customer, that, a client, I guess that's what we call them, sure. uh, that comes back uh, over and over I'm on the fourth project with them, which tells me they really like what I do. Great. And what else can you want? I'm having fun doing it. I'm, I'm loving life uh, uh, and uh, you have a great time uh, doing geology, and they tell me they like it. Yeah. Another thing that I've done is I've been writing articles for a for a trade journal called Aggregates Manager and a sister one in Australia called Quarry Australia. I've been writing articles there. Uh, this month I wrote my 200th article. Wow. Right, right one a month. Right. Um, and uh, it's, it's using, it's telling a geologic story to people, to aggregate producers who don't, or quarriers, right. who don't really do that much with geology. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, their life is is a result of geology, right. their livelihood, but right. they don't understand it. And so I write stories, and I have three goals. One is that they'll read the whole article, because I've, I've watched people, and if it's too long, you get about halfway through, and then you start skimming, and then you <laughs> fit, forget the end. That's so right. 600 words max, five, 575 really, max, one page. The second goal is they learn one new thing, and that's what I liked about my job, in the past, every day I learned something new. That's right. And I want them to learn one new thing. It doesn't have to be earth shattering. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be great. Just one new thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then the third goal is have them to want to read the next one. And so I make them personable, and I include 
stories about my grandkids mm -hmm. or my dogs yeah. or my wife. My, I don't get many in by my wife because she edits every one and grades me, <laughs> and she doesn't want me talking that much. And if I don't get an A on it, I won't do it. Right, so I, right. <laughs> Well, it's good that you have an, a, an editor in, in several senses. So. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so, so you have this expertise, and um, and you've done this kind of uh, translation work for the broader uh, aggregates community. Um, can you take this opportunity now for to? to I, I would like to take this opportunity now to ask you. Um, about the big shifts in the industrial minerals and aggregates industry in the United States and perhaps worldwide, what are the, some of the some of the big sea changes in uh, in those industries in the last ten or fifteen years? Sure, um, and I'd like to talk mostly about aggregates because I was mostly involved with that, and maybe spin off a little bit about some of the industrial minerals. As I mentioned a, a while back. Uh, um, when I first went into pits, there was no control. These were maybe not mom and pop organizations, but they were not big mega companies. Yeah. Um, they did a very good job, but there, there was no uh, reclamation required of pits. When you were done, that was enough. You know, the interstate highway system was was still underway. The construction was still underway, although the biggest push was over, but it was still going on, never never really finished until the 90s, it's still being, I mean, you're still seeing small ones, pieces. Yeah. So you're going along the roads and every every uh, five or 10 miles along the highway, you see a pit, which maybe now holds a motel <laughs> or a shopping center or something, but, you know, and, and they were not expected to be reclaimed. Mm -hmm. no, nobody asked them to, and I'm not sure what that would have done to the, to the effort if they had. Yeah. But but there was it was dig a, get a resource out of the ground. Yeah. There, the mining techniques were fairly well established. It's a, it's a, like construction, open just digging holes. The processing was processing was fairly uh, well established. But then as time went on and in the seventies, the environmentalism came in and, and nimbyism. Well, two things came about, NIMBYism, but the other was rapid urban growth. And if you go through the literature of, of the 70s, you will find all kinds of state geological surveys doing reports on what they call sterilizing aggregate resources. You have land that is, it's nice and flat, it's near a river, it's well-drained, sand and gravel. Perfect place to put a house, perfect place to put a septic system. And so you build your subdivisions there. Well, now where are you getting your sand and gravel from? Well, I, I guess under this house. Well, no, you're not. You're right. And so there were huge efforts put in uh, by the State Geological Service and a little bit by the USGS to identify where these resources were being covered up and being sterilized. And the project that I worked on in Connecticut was doing part of it. We were pointing out these are some of these are resources. They, they aren't just good places to live. And you may, and that's why I mentioned earlier how pleased I was that they had a protection of a of a quarry mm -hmm. on one of their plans of development. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that ever caught on. Mm -hmm. um, it it, it might have been one of those things we were worried about that we didn't need to worry about the mm -hmm. the Club of Rome kind of you know maybe right. Right. Maybe maybe it just wasn't a problem. Yeah. Uh, because we haven't found successful ways to protect them, and yet we're still getting sand and gravel and crushed stone. Yeah. Over time, people started uh, and nimbyism started requiring people to be more uh, responsible, mm -hmm. not only with how they mined, but closing the mine. Yeah. But there was some difficulties in understanding. A lot of times they wanted land restored to the original contour, mm -hmm. and when you dig out a hole and use what was in the hole to restore it to the original contour means digging another hole to fill it up, and then you know it's just a, a shell game that won't right. work. Right. And so it took it took some insight, and we found landscape architects getting involved with geologists and miners 
to come up with innovative ways to use reclaim or to reclaim land. And so you find real estate lakes. I, I was uh, doing some mapping and was kind of peeking around between houses from the road and di didn't want to get permission to go, so I wasn't going to knock on the door. I just peeking around. A woman came out and asked me what I was doing. I said, well, I'm just, just looking at the, the lake out there to get a sense. And she said, oh, yeah, we love it. And I said, did you know it was an old gravel pit? She was incensed. It was a gravel It was not. This is a lake. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful lake but it was reclaimed in a, in a nice manner. Uh, uh, beautiful, and they do the same with quarries. Cement plants in Lake Michigan have been, or the, the uh, limestone quarries to feed the cement plants are, are, have turned to some prime, really, really expensive uh, places. They turn, they turn old aggregate operations into pieces of art. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, recreational scuba diving. Rec recreational scuba diving, all yeah. kinds of wonderful uses. Yeah. And so people have caught on now. And so the reclamation part is, is, is a great change mm. from an open pit that maybe you could throw garbage into, mm. not a landfill, right. just throw garbage into mm. it, to some really fine aftermarket you know, second, second uses. Right. Uh, Equipment has gotten better. The, the methods of processing, the, the specifications for highways are always increasing. They're always trying to make highways better and better. And they, they learn that the size of the particles in the highway are important, and the grading of the sizes in the asphalt or concrete are important. And so they're constantly jiggling those, <clears throat> and, and aggregate operators have to find ways to to process it, to make those parts, because they don't come out all fractured and nice the same size. Mm -hmm. And, you, and you, you can't just break it all and sieve it and keep the best size yeah. and throw away everything else. You want to make sure that when you break it, you break it into a close to the approximate sizes. And that takes new types of crushers, new types of, uh, and new ways to feed the crusher. Do you choke feed it? Do you feed it where you flood it with aggregate, or do you gently feed all these things matter yeah but geology matters too the type of rock that's going in and if you find an aggregate operator that just treats their pit or more likely a quarry as is, is, is homogeneous rock they're going to wake up someday and, and have problems and I've had calls from people saying what's going on our rock is out of spec mm -hmm. well it was like this this is spec and 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 this is you know and it's it's real good. Then they mine it, and it's like this and this and this, and they're okay, and they're okay, and they're okay. Then all of a sudden, oh, we're out of spec. Well, it, it's been changing all along, right. but as long as it's rock. in spec, yeah. Yeah. it doesn't matter. And the rock was changing all along, and if they had caught that, they wouldn't have been surprised right. when they got here. Right. Right. And so things, and that's something that I've tried to make clear in some of my articles. Geology makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the methods of processing the equipment has gotten better for digging and for reclaiming uh, the, the the screening operations have become bigger, mm -hmm. bigger and bigger. We have we have operations that produce five million tons of aggregate a year. Uh, that was never the case. There are mega international companies now producing mm -hmm. aggregates. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the mom and pops hang in there, but during this last uh, housing bubble and then predatory lending and collapse of the housing bubble, uh, they had to go out of business. Yeah. I mean, the aggregate production went down to one quarter in some places, one wow. quarter, and most companies can't afford that. Well, the big ones hung in. A lot of the little ones were gone. Some of them had to sell to the big ones who buy it not for the resource, but to keep the small ones from coming back online right. when it's over. Right. And, and uh, it's an extremely competitive business. Um, it's, it, it, there's a, a good profit to be made if you do it right mm -hmm. uh, because of the volumes. You make a, a, a little bit of money on lots of stuff. You sell five million tons, you don't need to sell it, you know, make a lot of profit on each ton. Right, right, exactly. So the companies have gotten bigger in, in international companies. Yeah, and export? Is it, or is it too bulky to really export economically? Um, There's a small amount of export between 
uh, U.S. and Canada across the Great Lakes mm -hmm. and uh, Puget Sound area. Um, there's a, some between U.S. and Mexico. But where most of the exports take place are in the aggregate poor parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Florida is pretty starved for good quality aggregate. It's underlain by limestone, right. but it's a soft limestone that doesn't stand up. Yeah. And in particular, it doesn't have good skid resistant properties. When you build a road, you want something where when you're driving a car down the road and you come to a corner, it goes around the corner instead of off the corner. Right. That's called skid resistance. And there's a certain kind of rock that works for that. And Florida does not have that. Mm -hmm. And so they will actually import materials in Florida from Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. Porcupine no, no, uh, Mountain in Nova Scotia, and from the Yucatan, well, that's more limestone, but also from uh, parts of South America. Mm. They will, and it's because ocean transport is fairly reasonable, and because you don't need huge, huge, huge amounts of the, of the uh, uh, skid-resistant material. There was a, a short period of time when they tried exporting aggregate from Sweden over to the U.S., and it lasted for a while, largely because they would backhaul U.S. goods, mm -hmm. and so the backhaul was the main product, and they were just keeping an empty ship from going over there, so they put some rock in it. And hey, they did that in colonial times. All those right. cobbles, cobblestone streets right. are, are ballast, and so we imported aggregate in colonial times so they could haul the colonial products, tobacco and whatever else we were doing, back to, uh, back to England, back to the mother country, right? That's fascinating. They yeah. do the same in, in uh, Puget Sound, the, the airport took such a huge, expansion of the airport took such a huge demand of aggregates that they would uh, um, haul it down from Canada, from uh, British Columbia, right, and, right. and haul it down just because they couldn't match the, meet the demand and because local aggregate producers weren't quite willing to spend the, the capital Right. To for a one shot deal. Right, right. And the right. same happened with the Denver airport. Yeah. They they hauled aggregate here from Cheyenne. Right. Uh, because they didn't or past Cheyenne mm -hmm. because they nobody wanted to put the, the money into building new equipment for a for a three year project. Right, right, right. Um, I wanted to just return to your involvement in SME to, to sort of close off here. You've been chair of the SME Industrial Minerals and Aggregates Division. Yes. Yeah. So it, so that's a, a fairly high level of involvement and uh, and a tribute to you because you're a geologist. You wouldn't necessarily expect a, a geologist to be in that position. So that's a it's it's it speaks, I guess, to your uh, uh, the esteem that you're held in, in the community. Well, I, I, I guess so, or maybe I gain some of the esteem by doing it. That's right. Um, at that time. We had a career ladder. The division had a career ladder, and there were seven rungs on the ladder. And you started out as a technical in a technical uh, group, right? Uh, organizing the 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 uh, writing of technical articles. Then you became in charge of that group, and then you you worked your way up through various things. Seven years, and so you got to learn an awful lot about the division and about SME, mm -hmm. and some and. Not only on that ladder, you were you were also then coerced or volunteered <laughs> to go on various other committees, including SME, not just division committees, but SME committees. Yeah. And I took my job seriously. I figured if Uncle Sam was paying my way here, I owed it to the taxpayers to do a good job when mm -hmm. I was here. Yeah. And so I volunteered for these things and learned a lot about the group, and it was a a, a really wonderful ride mm -hmm. uh, up the ladder. Yeah. Uh, um, gave me, but it introduced me to people and gave me insights about the industry that I never would have gotten mm -hmm. without being here. And I said earlier, SME was a compass for me, yeah. and and these people were little lodestones that I, my needles pointing to. Right, right. Uh, other others I've talked to, not in mining, but in, actually the one that comes to mind is pharmacokinetics, but. Uh, Scientists and engineers talk about um, how much they learn from contacts with industry, for example. So this this guy was an academic, and uh, his involvement with industry, he learns 
research questions. They come from the, 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 the industry is puzzled by something, and, and so you're, by doing this kind of work for AI, AI sorry, SME, you're getting exposed to puzzles that Absolutely. you're solving. Yes, yes. Um, well, uh, a good example of that, I guess, would be um, we had a, a part of the Front Range project, and I was fully involved in SME when that was going on. Uh, there are oil wells around. And I had to learn something about oil wells. Now, I, I don't care that much about oil, other than I put it in my car and I glad the gas price is down. <laughs> but I had to learn something about oil wells and how you take care of them and what you do, because there were oil wells competing with aggregate. Not only were there houses competing with aggregate, and farmers competing with aggregate, there were oil wells. And you can buy up a farm, but you, what do you do with an oil well? Well, you, ha you have to leave a pad around that for work over rigs. You have to leave a way to get to that pad. There's a pipe transporting the oil out of that rig. You have to leave that in place. So it turns out that if you think you've got a large reserve of aggregate around, you've lost a big hunk of it if it's in the middle of an oil field. And Denver happened to be in part of the DJ Basin, and there were oil wells complicating things all over the place. And mm -hmm. so I worked with people from the industry uh, and people familiar with the oil industry to uh, prepare maps showing how much aggregate is lost because of oil wells. Because you know oil well is going to win out. Yeah, sure, sure. I guess it's it's one of the things that's most striking by these insights that you have is that uh, it would never have occurred to me that um, aggregate quarries would be a kind of scarce resource that you know you're almost talking about it as if it were like wetlands or something <laughs> it's like industrial industrial wetlands that need protection uh, or not need protection but need to be monitored uh, in terms of the other competing land use right and that 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 this is something that needs to be uh, monitored and that the industry needs to be aware of and that the competing industries need to be aware of as well. Yes, and probably the industry itself is aware of, of uh, aggregate problems with aggregate or, or any industrial mineral. The main people that don't are the decision makers, the ones that allow the industry to do what they would like to do, and they all. In the, there's large parts of the U.S. where, in the north, where glaciers covered the land with thick material that does not contain gravel, and it you can you can go tens, hundreds of feet, to to I'm mean not tens of hundreds, tens of feet or hundreds of feet. <clears throat> To find good rock, there's no gravel any place, right. and, to, and to find good rock. And St. Joe was right at the cusp of that. You'd, you'd, go, you'd mine through 30, 40 feet of nasty, ugly ground. It, it's till, but it, glacial till, but it's a gray, sticky, nasty clay. You wear boots on it, and you lift up your foot, and the foot and the boot comes off. It's stuck <laughs> in there. I mean, it's nasty stuff. And you've got to get rid of all that. And, and St. Joe was about as far north as you could go to get a hole, and then any farther north up in Iowa, they couldn't dig deep enough. It, the, it, the, they could, but the stripping ratio, the, the, it was too expensive. It just cost too much to take it off to get it at what you got when you got there. Right. And so they were buying aggregate, in, uh, crushed stone in Iowa, they were buying it from quarries in St. Joe. Right. Well, people think, it, yeah. Not in my backyard. Do it over there. Well, it isn't over there. Right. And that happens with all industrial minerals are even more defined because of their geology. Right. It's I mean, aggregate. Everybody thinks it's every place. It's not. Right. There's lots of rock that does not make good aggregate. Right. More that doesn't make good aggregate than does. Right. But, uh, you know, they seem to think that everything is available wherever they want it. And, of course, today, the idea is we'll get it from China. That we don't have to. We don't even have to buy it in the U.S. anymore. Don't have to destroy anything, mm -hmm. but we better be ready to deal with the issues of that. And a, a little story it used to be with potash. Great story. When the when the country was first settled, in in the New Englanders were, were farmers, and they had to clear their land. Well. It was expensive to clear their land, but when they cut the trees, they burned them, turned them into ash, 
put those ash, that ash into pots and soaked in water and made a chemical called potash, or a material called potash, which was very valuable. And it about paid for the cost of clearing the land. And that was the only cash crop they had to start with. Well, as time went by, a, a, nat a source of naturally occurring rock-based potash was discovered in Germany. And, and people said, hallelujah, you know, we, we've got all the potash we need now. And we were importing 90% of our potash, or, or more, from Germany. Well, potash is one of the ingredients in gunpowder. And when World War I came around, and Germany was the only source of potash, we got a little concerned. Yes. <laughs> and then the rest of the story is, you know, we found a local source and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But you, you put all your eggs in one basket, you may not want them in that basket sometime. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's been a story that's been repeated, uh, that there's um, kind of in the background that people don't, they may make it explicit, as, as you have, and it, sometimes it's just in, in the background, that, that there, is a, there is a geostrategic element to, to mining. Oh, absolutely. That, that this is, in, in, in for certain military and defense purposes, it had better be in your backyard because mm -hmm. if you're dependent mm -hmm. on a single source that might be in hostile territory, you're in an awful lot of trouble. Perfect example. Um, Rarus, another one of those industrial minerals that nobody ever knew about, probably everybody knows now or, or has heard the term and thinks yeah. they know all about it, but right. they don't. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, the U.S. used to be the world's largest producer of rare earths. <clears throat> and then China came on board and could produce it a whole lot cheaper. We stopped all of our rare earth production. And it wasn't until, I believe, last year that we resumed rare earth mining in the U.S. Yeah, in Mountain Pass. Yeah, in yeah. <clears throat> Same goes with <clears throat> fluorospar. It's a material that's used in... All kinds of things primarily make hydrofluoric acid, mm -hmm. which then is a, a feedstock in all kinds of chemical industries, but it's also in your toothpaste. Right. Uh, and it's used heavily in, in, as a flux in steel. Well, we used to produce, used, the U.S. used to produce all it needed, and then it became, uh, it was a hand cob, something you'd pick out of the rock by itself. Very expensive to do. So they started bringing it in from Mexico. Next thing you know, uh, they come along and, and, and uh, prohibit the use of hydro of chloro, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbon, yes. right. which is, uh, has fluoros, comes from fluorospar. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's no, the demand drops down. The, the U.S. marketers say, you know, say we can't make a profit anymore. So eventually all the U.S. markets, closed, their mines closed. And we started getting it again from China, too, yeah. got into it. Well... China's kind of starting to keep some of the stuff themselves now, and prices are coming back up. And we opened up a florist bar mine once again in Kentucky last year. So the wheel goes round and round. But people need to understand this. And if they just said, we don't need florist bar anymore, let's build over all this stuff, let's never permit another thing, wrong. We, 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 we don't want to go there. Right, right. So there are, the lesson is, I think, from your career and uh, from your insights that uh, – Interdisciplinarity is the key, and we need to keep our eye on the the larger picture in anything. It's not just a particular technology, or not a, just a narrow research area. It has to you have to understand how it fits into all sorts of other disciplines and all sorts of other um, social and political and economic areas. Absolutely. Which which piece of the puzzle is it? Right. It's <laughs> exactly. As long as you get to work on solving it. As long as I get to solve the puzzle. <laughs> Mr. Langer, thank you very much for your time. Oh, it's been it. a pleasure.